the family history of the bourbon goes back, you know, 40 years with my father. And as the inaugural member of the Bourbon Hall of Fame, Dad was truly one of the treasures in the industry, just a treasure of a human. When Angel's Envy was first started, it was just really th the three generations, my dad, myself, and my grandfather. And we launched Angel's Envy March of 2011, and we wanted to have a product that was very unique. Dad and I kicked around a lot of different ideas, but you know, I also wanted Dad to be really hyper-engaged in what we were doing. So I asked him about secondary barrel finishes, and it's something he enjoyed doing, and he kept coming back to that and coming back to that. Finishing whiskey really excites us because we're taking a traditional product like bourbon, and we're kind of taking it at our own twist on it. That double maturation, the finish, the secondary aging, it really set the stage for what we wanted Angels and V to be in the future. Over the past couple of years, more of my siblings have started joining the brand. They bring a lot of differing opinions and differing viewpoints, which has really assisted in us growing as a brand overall. We're already seeing uh, the boys as part of the business, from distillation to operations to blending, and even relying on them now for innovation. A place that family has really come into play was our initial cellar collection launch. We launched a sherry finish, and there was a few ways we could have gone with the finish um, being blended together at the end. Eventually, between Andrew, myself, and my dad, we were able to compromise and, and create a very balanced whiskey that brought a little bit of each uh, of those worlds to the, to the end game. One of the cool things about Angel's Envy is we consider our entire family of employees to be family as well. We have a great team overall across the board here, you know, from distilling all the way to the market where I, with our Whiskey Guardians. Our Whiskey Guardian program is, is second to none. We have some of the best bartenders in the world, uh, people who are passionate about whiskey, passionate about Angel's Envy, passionate about doing the right things in their community. I can't imagine um, not having them uh, with us on this journey. Universally, I feel a passion from the folks that, that I interact with that love Angel's Envy. They, they connect with our story. They connect with what's in the bottle. They connect with the heritage, and they believe in some of the things we're doing going forward, which I think is really fun and exciting and something I never could have imagined. Welcome to Nightcap Live. I'm Dan Dunn. On behalf of Flavia, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy Zooming schedule to join us. As you can see, I'm coming to you tonight from the Ponderosa. And in just a little bit, Haas, Little Joe, and Ben Cartwright are going to be moseying along. For all you kids out there under the age of 50, that's a reference to Bonanza. It was a television show that aired a long time ago on NBC. NBC being a television network. That's a thing people used to watch before Netflix and Hulu came along. Anyway, our real guests tonight, the real people that are coming on this show, both of whom are gonna be on in just a couple of minutes. Uh, first, we've got a burger expert. And who doesn't need another burger expert in their life? But this guy knows more than anybody, George Motes. And then when you got a burger, you, what do you got? You gotta have some whiskey, you gotta have some whiskey. And for that, we have the co-founder of Angels Envy, Wes Henderson. Very excited about this lineup we have tonight. Uh, me, George, and Wes would love to hear from you. So I invite you to troll us. Get in there and troll, say nasty things. Do it. Do it. <laughs> I'm kidding. I want you to be nice. Tough time right now. Uh, you can submit questions and comments via the comments box, which is under the live stream. Right below, see it down there. And we'll try to get to as many of those as we can throughout this broadcast. Speaking of casts, I host one of the pod variety. It's called What We're Drinking with Dan Dunn. It's available everywhere podcast stream, and I invite you to check it out. What we're drinking on this show tonight, but by the way, specifically what we're drinking is the Angel's Envy, and we got the Kentucky Straight Bourbon, and then we've got the uh, rum cast finished rye. See, there it is. There they are. I dipped into the bourbon already. Had to do it. Had to happen. Um, per usual, it's a thing we do here. We're doing a contest tonight. And the prize is a quarterly Flaviar membership. Flaviar is a premium spirits club. You get curated tasting boxes every quarter with a full size bottle in there, limited editions, brands of them, only to members. Of course, much more 
And here's how you can win the Flaviar membership tonight. Since Wes is from Kentucky, Angel's Envy from Kentucky, I want you to name the top five coolest living actors who are from Kentucky. By from, I mean they spent most of their formative years there. And by living, I mean they're not Harry Dean Stanton, who is the coolest actor ever from Kentucky. But alas, Harry Dean is no longer breathing. So again, it's the top five coolest actors from Kentucky. You may think this is subjective, but it's not. It's a definitive list decided upon by me. If you get it right, you get the same list that I have in my head. You. (laughs) So uh, send those comments in again below. And at the end of this broadcast, we're going to pick a lucky winner. Um, Our first guest is an author, filmmaker, and resident burger expert on First We Feast. The new show premieres Tuesday, this Tuesday, Burger Scholar Sessions. Fad, can we run a little uh, little clip here of our man? Let's smoke a burger. This will be your deep dive into the wonderful world of regional hamburgers. I have a ball of beef. A lot of times you cook burgers, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. The whole damn thing goes into the bur- Oh, shit. Step back. Mmm. Oh. Mm. Oh. 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 The Burger Scholar Sessions with me, George Motes. There he is with hair. We, we going to the same barber? George Motes, everybody. George Motes, yeah. Let's clap it up. I hope you're all clapping it up. There you go. George, how are you, buddy? I think we do have the same barber, which is the quarantine barber. Right? And the same stylist, clearly. Same stylist. Same, 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 same shirt and everything. You wearing cool bracelets, too? Yeah. No, no, I don't. Right. Not, not just in the way. How are you, my friend? I'm great. How are you doing? Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. It's great to have you. I mean, you're a burger expert, right? You are a burger expert. What does that mean? Well, I didn't give myself the, the title. I mean, the title was actually given by the media. The media decided that I was an expert when they started calling me on TV shows to say, we have a, a hamburger expert. I mean, what makes me an expert is that I've written a lot of uh, books about hamburgers. I've, I've had a couple of TV shows about hamburgers. I have a lot of passion for hamburgers. I know a lot. And over the past like, basically 20 years, I've done more research than just about anybody on the subject of the American hamburger. So that's what makes you're, me an expert. You're traveling all over America trying burgers. I always, I'm, I'm constantly on the road. Well, not right now, but I'm constantly on the road uh, looking for new burgers. People send me suggestions all the time and I take them all very seriously. You know, the mom and pop places that are out there that I don't know about, I go, I go to them, you know, but it's also become a global phenomenon. Now. I've been traveling around the world teaching workshops on how to make real American hamburgers to foreigners who don't really know. They don't really know. Where are some of the hot places in America? Once, once quarantine is lifted, for burger, people that love burgers, where should they go? Where are the hot spots here? You know, people go to the coasts. They love New York City. They love they go love, to, love Miami. They love going to L.A. for burgers. But honestly, the best burger experiences are really to be had in the center of the country, what we call our flyover states. Unfortunately, a lot of people refer to them as flyover states. But the best, what I call primary source burgers in America, are in what we call the, the American Burger Belt, which runs from Texas all the way north to, say, Wisconsin. If you draw a line between Texas and Wisconsin, that's where all the great primary source real American hamburgers are. Okay. So, George, you know the old saying, if I knew you were coming, I'd have baked the cake, right? <laughs> so, yeah. I, I did know you were coming. And what I did is I got a burger. Nice. See that <laughs> thing right there? See this thing? Yeah. Nice. So, I, uh, this, I got this uh, burger delivered, contact free from nice. a- Baby Blue's Barbecue right here in Venice, California. Can I tell you what's on this burger? You tell me what you think. It's a, uh, it's a bacon blue burger. It's got uh, chopped bacon, blue cheese crumbles, green onions, garlic, Ooh. ground pepper, salt, and the sauce is a lingonberry sauce mixed Sweet. with mustard. Yeah. And it's on a brioche bun here. And uh, if you don't mind, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a little bite. Go right ahead. I'll tell you though, when you're taking that bite, that I know it's gonna be a great burger. Because I can see, I can see it looks pretty good. But also, it's made by barbecue guys. You know, bar- 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 barbecue people, whether guys or girls, I'm not sure. But barbecue people know meat. They know meat. They love meat. 
Ross, the thing about barbecue is that no one's going to give you bad barbecue if they're really selling it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they're, they're, they're going to give you their meat. They're going to give you the best they possibly can. So you're hoping that also translates to the burger as well. What's your feeling on the pickle? Because I'm well, not only a big pickle guy on a burger. You? Oh, I, I love pickles. You don't necessarily have to put them on the burger, but the pickle is very important actually scientifically because if you're eating something that's sort of heavy and cheesy and fatty and you take a bite of a pickle, you actually, you actually you change the pH in your mouth and in your, in your stomach as well. Your brain says, oh, here comes an acid. Here comes a little, little uh, break. It actually cuts through the fat. So scientifically, it's actually very important. I'm going to try one more little bite because I want to ask you, what about the whiskey? I've got some of the bourbon here. Do you think the whiskey, what's this going to do to the burger? Well, first of all, you're eating a you're eating a smokehouse burger, which is great. I mean, it, it, I have this weird thing. Wherever I smell smoke, if I'm at a barbecue, I have to reach for a beer. I've got to reach for a whiskey. Actually, in most cases, I do reach for a whiskey before I reach for a beer, uh, especially when I smell smoke. And it's the same thing. If you're cooking outside and you're cooking a burger, and that smoke's hitting you in the face. That you really all you really want to do right then is it, it evokes. You know, it's very evocative. It, it, it's you want to go and reach for. For a, a whiskey, for sure. I do it every time. Accentuating it right there, having the having the bourbon right there, I think is bringing out it's it's a little lively thing here going on. Yeah, it definitely does. And I have a lot of Southern relatives. I have a lot of relatives from South Carolina, and they drink whiskey all the time, and they spend a lot of time outside cooking. When you're cooking outside, a lot of whiskey comes out. They have a drink. They have a drink in South Carolina. My family has called Brown, and they'll say, "Hey, Georgie, fetch me a Brown." <laughs> brown is literally nothing more than uh, good bourbon. Pour it over ice with uh, ginger ale, which is basically a Jack and Ginger. <laughs> pretty good. Is there anything that you would say is off limits to put on a burger? Like maybe a sauce or, you know, some people like ketchup and mustard, mayo. Is there something you would say that just simply does not belong on a burger that you've yeah. seen on a burger before? Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of things don't belong on a burger. A burger should be kept very simple. You should really, you should take a burger and look at it and say, you know, does it have one or two things on it that I, I want to eat, sure. You really, honestly, I, people don't want to hear this, but they shouldn't put bacon on a burger. Um, but the biggest no-no is you should never actually put uh, ketchup on a burger. Ketchup is one of those flavors that will actually destroy the flavor of the beef. It'll take away from the flavor of the beef, yeah. Really? Now, I mean, somehow I'll take, I'll take lingonberry about, sauce <laughs> over ketchup. <laughs> what, about ketchup what about ketchup with uh, mayo mixed in? Well, yeah, because mayo, of course, is it's very fatty. Uh, and you you do actually add a lot of flavor to ketchup when you add mayo to ketchup, and you become obviously you end up with a sauce that is that's a very well balanced sauce, a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of fat. And it's actually really good for a burger. It works really well with a burger. And why no on the bacon? Bacon to me is a very overpowering uh, flavor. I mean, it's smoked meat should be enjoyed on its own. I don't think it should be on a burger at all. It's also the problem with bacon sometimes is, is that it's a physical thing. Sometimes you bite into a burger with a bacon and the bacon comes right out. You end up, it snaps back in your face if it's not cooked, cooked, you know, enough. So it's kind of hard to get bacon right. You're going to have to be kind of a bacon expert to know how to get bacon right on a burger. Speaking of getting it right, this whiskey. And I, George, you look like a man who likes a good whiskey and I, I don't want to keep you waiting any longer. So I think it's time to it's time to bring on our, our next guest, um, the man of the hour here. The, the late Lincoln Henderson was a legendary master distiller, and he was an inaugural member of the Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Fame back in 2001. Lincoln went in. In 2006, he and his son Wes began experimenting with bourbon finished in port barrels, which led to the creation of Angel's Envy. Today, Take my word for this on this. Angel's Envy is one of the premier whiskeys on the market. But if you don't want to take my word, you need proof. Well, last year, Wes Henderson joined his dad in the Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Fame. And tonight, we are very lucky that he joins us. Mr. Wes Henderson, how are you, buddy? Doing great, Dan. Thank you. George, how are you? Great. That is better now. I've got one of these watering today. over here. This burger stuff, it's killing me, man. I'm, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to drink my dinner because I don't have a burger. Don't mind me, Wes. Go ahead. So how long are you coming to us from tonight? I'm actually I'm down in Florida right now. Um, I live in Kentucky most of the time, but but down here doing some stuff and uh, just just happy to have been invited on the show with uh, with you and, and George. And we'll we'll talk about some bourbon and talk about some burgers, whatever you all want to talk about, man. Well, I got to ask you right up, being a Kentucky man, how are you feeling about uh, no derby this weekend? Yeah, it, it's it's kind of it's tough to think about. Of course, the weather's supposed to be amazing, which makes it suck even more. 
But, you know, in the context of everything that's going on, the Derby isn't really important. You know, I mean, we, we certainly hate to miss it. Uh, it's going to happen in September, we hope. So we'll just drink a bunch of mint juleps this weekend and pretend that the Derby's happening. You know, I have, half of us are blacked out for the Derby anyway. So it, it really doesn't, you know, we'll just, we'll just continue the mint julep tradition. Sure. I, I got to ask you, Wes, you're, you know, your dad passed uh, in 2013. Mm-hmm. And he left you in charge of Angel, Angel's Envy. What's it like carrying on your dad's legacy? Um, it, it's it's been a lot of fun. It really has been. I think it, at the very beginning, you know, anytime you've got a legend that you're walking with, and uh, you know, it it makes it a little more difficult because dad was truly one of the. And I think if you count on both hands, probably enlist the top influencers in the bourbon world, dad would probably be one in the in, in the top ten for sure. So uh, it definitely uh, creates some. Uh, some pressure to 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 do good and do the right things, and uh, I've been blessed and got some great kids that I work with, and I think we've created some great things together. And um, so, Dad still walks with us, you know, he does. We we talk talk with him and uh, bounce ideas off of each other and and think about what he would do. And uh, but now we're just kind of doing our thing. Well, and he's in the bottle. He's in every bottle too, you know. That's Absolutely. the beauty of this stuff. It lives on. And, uh, Absolutely. What do you uh? I think we should get into some whiskey here because I'm the only one really putting it. I'm I've already had a burger. I've already had, you know, I've got this. I'm feeling bad guys. I'm feeling bad. So what do you want to start with Wes? Let's start with uh, the bourbon, our angels envy bourbon. Uh, It's a Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey finished in port wine barrels. This is kind of what we would call our, uh, our flagship bourbon. And it's a good place to start. I got angels envy glasses here. You see this? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you probably do that too. <laughs> yeah. So this is uh this is finished in port wine barrels, Wes, right? So uh that's pretty uncommon for bourbon, right? It it is well it was when we started the company, but now we're seeing it more and more often, you know, finishing in other barrels. But we're really the first to take American whiskey and make it our cornerstone. And now, of course, we'll do our rye a little bit later. That's finished in a different barrel. We've got other products finished in other barrels. But, you know, where it, when it first came out, there was a little bit of noise about it. Um, but you're seeing everybody do it now. So I guess that means we did something right. So we're going to nose this thing. Let's not ram our noses into the glass. Let's breathe it in. You're supposed to keep your mouth open when you breathe yeah. in. Yeah, that's what I recommend. It vents off some of the alcohol. Angel's Envy's uh, 86.6 proof, so it's you know it's got a little bit of little bit of punch, but not too much. And on, on the nose, on the nose, you get those dried fruits, you get the vanilla, the typical Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey notes when you you know when you nose it. Hmm, it's fantastic. You mentioned the proof, Wes. You know, proof is defined as double the percentage of, of alcohol by volume, and the proof statement's legally permitted on a bottle, but it's not required. Why are we still using it? proof and where did it come from well i mean proof well, there's a lot of theories about where proof came from uh most of it's linked back to the the wild west times where um you would take some gunpowder mix it with some some uh some spirits and if the gunpowder would ignite you knew that it was at least 50 percent alcohol so it was proof that it was a certain alcohol that's that's the story that's behind it you know of course with bourbon it's all about the stories and who knows which is which is true and which is bullshit but it uh, it's a good story and it's there's some science behind it so it probably makes sense. By the way, we're going to jump in and taste this and I invite everybody that's watching at home to fire off your questions and comments. You got anything for Wes or George? We'll we'll get to them on the show here tonight. So Cheers. Cheers, gentlemen. Cheers. <clears throat> Can I ask a question? <laughs> mhm. Angel's Envy. Now, is there? I know that the Angel's Share is something that is in the whiskey lore, right? Is that is the Angel? Is this the Angel's Envy? The Angel has the envy for the the share. What's the, what's the story there? Well, the, the story is the Angels get their share. Right. What's left? They're envious of because we have it, and that's where the name Angel's Envy came from. Ah, okay. There you go. So, I mean, the science behind the angels, angel shares, we lose about 3 to 5% a year to evaporation. So we say we're sharing that with the angels as it goes up into the warehouse. And uh, actually, the first year, we can lose 10%. So 3 to 5% a year after that. And it, it was really fun how that story evolved because the angel share is so important. And people know what it is. So angels, I mean, just seemed like a natural way to go with it. 
Perfect. <laughs> we Great got a question. question. We got a question from Ed in Texas, and he wants to know what was the inspiration for the unusual bottle shape. I, I appreciate that. Um, it, it happened very naturally when we started talking about uh, the angel share, and that led to angels envy. I think you think of wings a lot of times when you think of angels. So uh, we wanted wings on the back of the bottle, which the bottle does have wings on, on the back. It might be hard to see here. And then the shape of the bottle just conformed to the shape of the wings is how it all came down. We, you know, it, it, our, our design team came together with the idea and we knew right away how we wanted it to look. And, but it was unusual, you know, 10 years ago, this was an unusual bottle. You know, it, it wasn't, you know, square and, you know, something named old Colonel or, you know, named after some dead guy, you know, as you see, a lot of bourbons have been named over the years. And to have a bottle that's, that's you know, the bottle's, I'd say, even a little bit sexy. So, but now it's become, I would say, one of those iconic bottles that you can pick out on the back bar anywhere. True. It's true. What do you, how would you describe the flavor profile of this, Wes? Angel's Envy is a very accessible bourbon. It, it's kind of the best of both worlds. It's got a lot of complexity. So somebody who is a bourbon aficionado can definitely appreciate it because of the uh, complexity. But it's also accessible. So for somebody that's new to the category, it's uh, it's it's a bourbon that is 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 very easy to drink. It's a great introduction to bourbon. Uh, I don't know if I don't know if I like the the phrase gateway bourbon, but it, it's it's something that you can start with, and and that's that's a that's one of the best ways to describe it. And would you uh, what would, would you like to do the the uh, the bourbon with cocktails? What are your kind of favorite drinks for? This? I'm I'm blessed to be able to experience all kinds of cocktails around the world with some of that. We have our whiskey guardians who are our uh, brand ambassadors or some of the top bartenders in the world. And they come up with things that just mad scientist stuff that you wouldn't believe. And I, I love all of it. If you really drill down my call, typically it's not real simple. I mean, it's not real sexy. It's really simple is a whiskey sour, a proper whiskey sour with egg white. That's my go-to. And then I just branch out from there. I'll usually try spirits neat though. If I'm trying something for the first time, especially I'll always drink it neat. And then I'll segue over to a cocktail. Gotcha. We got a question from Tim Hill. He wants to know, Wes, what is the difference between bourbon and Kentucky straight bourbon? That's a, that's a really good question. So Kentucky straight bourbon, well, the, let's talk about the difference between bourbon and straight bourbon. Uh, straight bourbon has to be aged at least two years. So that, that's the definition of straight. To be Kentucky bourbon, it has to be manufactured in Kentucky and has to be aged in Kentucky. So uh, that, that's, that's now codified in state law. But the federal law has to do with the, the straight part. So straight whiskey, two years. Anything that's less than four years, though, you have to say how old it is. So two years straight, anything less than four years, you have to say how old it is. Great question. It's a very confusing thing. There's a lot of uh, you know, mis, uh, misinformation about how, how that applies. But technically, it's bourbon the minute it hits that barrel. Georgia Lola Scott on Facebook wants to know what makes a good bourbon. I know the answer. Wes Henderson. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Rowdy points. We, and... we, set, we set that one up, didn't we? Thank, thank you. <laughs> Zach Allen wants to know where in Kentucky is your distillery? Our distillery is in downtown Louisville. It's on Main Street. It's a, it's a magical place. We've brought a bourbon renaissance to downtown Louisville. We're right across from Slugger Field, which is a AAA ballpark for the Cincinnati Reds. Mm. And there are several distilleries downtown. Louisville is a bourbon destination now, a bourbon destination and a food destination. Isn't it amazing? So you can come and 15 years ago, there were no distilleries in the downtown core of, of Louisville. And, the, you know, a lot of the distilleries were on the outskirts and, and, and then this thing just blew up. And now, what are there, 13, 14 distilleries down there now? Something in that? There, there are a bunch of us. And originally, my thought was to maybe go out in the countryside and like in, in your Woodford. or, But then I really started thinking about the history of Louisville with bourbon and how the history had kind of moved out of Louisville. And I thought it would be great to bring bourbon back to an urban setting. So I just started talking with some people. And lo and behold, we were the first full production distillery downtown Louisville. But... You can come and see us. Uh, Old Forster's a great brand. They're down there. They're right up the street from us. Uh, there's a, there's a, Michter's is there. They're good friends of ours. You can come and see those guys. So you can come to Louisville for the, you know, for several days and, and see the distilleries and have some great food. And uh, the hotel scene's really cool too. I never would have thought 10 years ago, I'd be saying, Hey, come to Louisville. Cause there's a ton of stuff to do. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, Justin Silver in New York city is asking, does bourbon continue to age in the bottle 
the same as it does in a barrel. Well, it, definitely not the same in a barrel, but does, does, is there any aging that happens in the bottle and how long does it take? It doesn't age the same in, in the bottle as it does in the barrel. And, and aging is, uh, there are things that happen in a bottle like oxidation and, and those typically aren't good things that can happen in a bottle. As long as the bottle has a good seal, it's not going to change a whole lot. It's not going to age anymore. Uh, but you know, you just need to try to protect that bottle as long as you can. I've had bottles of whiskey or bourbon that from the early 1900s that are incredible, but I've also had some that were really bad because the, the, you know, the oxidation. So, um, legally though, the minute it leaves that barrel, we have to stop the clock on how old it is. Okay. Right, well, the, the, the barrel breathes, right? So when it's actually, when it's sitting in a barrel, it's breathing, it's, it's changing rapidly. I mean, the, it's, it's working with the temperature in the house whether it's hot or cold, and it's breathing, right? That's, that's the most important part. When it's in your bottle, it's not breathing anymore unless you leave it open. <laughs> exactly. And, 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 and it's not extracting from the wood either. And, you know, Kentucky's the perfect environment for aging whiskey. The summers are just hot enough and long enough. The winters are just cold enough and long enough where in the summer that bourbon is, is uh, pushing into the wood, it's expanding, pushing into the wood. In the winter, it's contracting, coming back out of the wood. And, and every time you have that cycle, it's bringing things in, in and out of that wood. And... Uh, the caramelization from the charred barrel, all those incredible flavors come from that barrel. 100% of the flavor, on 100%, I'd say a good portion of the uh, of the flavor comes from the barrel, and the, but 100% of the color definitely comes from the barrel. Mm. Well, Wes, you just touched on it, part of the reason, but uh, Riley on YouTube is asking, why does Kentucky produce the best bourbon? You just talked about the the climate conditions. What else is it about Kentucky that makes it such an ideal place to produce bourbon? The climate is definitely very important. Really, there's just so much history there. You know, you have families that have been making bourbon for generations. Uh, our family, you know, half a century or more making bourbon there. The Bean family, eight generations of those folks have been making bourbon. So uh, we have the raw materials there to make bourbon. We have lots of corn, lots of the other grains that we need to make bourbon. The technology is, is uh, our stills are made in Louisville. Vendome makes our stills. So everything is really right there. So you've got generations of experience. You've got a great climate. That's not to say you can't make decent bourbon other places. 95% of the bourbon in the world is made in Kentucky. We have more barrels of bourbon in warehouses than we do people. Um, we don't read or write too good sometimes, but we definitely have uh, we have lots of whiskey. Nice. George, got one for George here. Nope. Where's the best veggie burger? <laughs> oh, that's wrong. I don't want to be my friend. I don't <laughs> um, nowhere, honestly. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, you know, this is the you know I don't I don't follow I purposely don't follow veggie burgers. What is this thing you're talking about? Veggie burgers. Right. <laughs> uh, all right, we'll leave that one go uh, back you to you. Want to stay with chicken? That one? That was that? The, is that a veggie burger? <laughs> yeah, sure. Chicken's close to a veggie. You got a good chicken burger anywhere? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, Mike Dembler on YouTube says, "Love Angels Envy." Definitely in my top five. Uh, was lucky enough to discover it on a trip, uh, the Rye on a trip to Austin. Wes, why is it in such limited distribution, the, the rye? He can get the bourbon at Costco, but he hasn't been able to get the rye there. What's going on over there, Wes? Well, it's it's selling out. It's highly allocated, and it's just one of those things that we're making as much as we can. We just finished a bottling run this past week of rye, so it's going to be out in the stores a little bit more. It's just, unfortunately, it's supply and demand. Uh, you know, it's a very popular you know, popular, uh, popular uh, whiskey. So we're, but we're trying to make more. So please keep looking. Uh, keep looking. It'll be there. Uh, Matt Hoffmeister wants to know when you're making a, we're making an old fashioned with Angel's Envy. Do you have a particular bitters that you recommend? I really don't. Uh, and I'll leave that to our uh, mixologists that, that, that know more than I'll ever know about making cocktails. Truthfully, I'm not a great cocktail maker. Um, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll defer to them. I wish I could I'll recommend something, but <laughs> I know. Please do. I mean, I like Dale DeGroff's pimento bitters. In oh, old Dale, Dale's it's, awesome. It's yeah. fantastic, and you know you can't go wrong with the old standby Angostura. You know, and Gary Gary Reagan's uh, bitters got that little bit of orange in there, which I think really adds. Uh, can we raise a toast here to Gary Reagan? There we go. The late great Gary Reagan. Sure, we always like raised toast here on Nightcap Live. Um, Somebody else asked about the veggie burger. Oh, they're not going to let you go on this, George. They are not going to let you go. Here's another one for you, Wes, from Scott uh, Krinsky. We know your father for from creating Woodford, Woodford Reserve, but he did so much more. What nuggets did Lincoln 
also do that we might not know? Ooh, that's a great question. Oh, that's a really good question. Well, Dad was a Brown Foreman. He was our master distiller involved in whiskey for uh, for almost 40 years. So Brown Foreman, Whitford Reserve, Gentleman Jack, Jack Daniels, Single Barrel, uh, Don Eduardo Tequila. You know, he was involved in wine maturation when Brown Foreman did, did, did wine. So any uh, vodka, also icy vodka. So pretty much any spirit that you can imagine, Dad had his, had his hand in at some, at some point in time. But Woodford, Gentleman Jack, Jack Daniels, Single Barrel are, are really the, the big three. Growing up in that environment, Wes, was it was it did the mad was it a bug that you caught early on in life? Was there did you always know that you wanted to kind of follow in your dad's footsteps, or was there a, a different path for you? I mean, I know you did some different things before this, but is this something you always wanted to do, or it took a while to come around to it? It took a while. It's not something I always wanted to do. I was always fascinated with the science. I was I was kind of a science geek growing up, but it, it just what my dad did. You know, I didn't recognize really until a lot later in life the historical significance of what he was doing. And uh, he was just, uh, you know, a scientist. Dad was really a scientist and a chemist. And as I got older, I did other things, like you said, and then gravitated back toward didn't really gravitate back toward, toward to the industry until dad was retiring from Brown Foreman. And that's when I felt like it might be fun to do something with uh, with my dad and my sons and decided to start Angels Envy and coaxed dad out of retirement, which really wasn't that hard uh, because I think he wanted to have some fun. And then we were just off to the races after that. Mm, beautiful. I want to let's 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 get into the to the next one, the finished rye. And while we're doing, we got a couple of questions here for George. George, is there a burger chain that you tolerate? That I can tolerate? No, yeah. there's actually a bunch. I do. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, actually very good uh, fresh beef burger chains. That's the most important thing. It has to be, you know, they have to be make, make burgers with fresh beef. There's a couple of them out there. Not many, unfortunately, but one of them, my favorites is a place called Steak and Shake. Steak and Shake makes one of the, the hands down the best fresh beef smash burgers in, the, in America. Five Guys is also fantastic. What's that? Where are they located, Steak and Shake? Steak and Shake has, uh, I think they may have 500 locations all through the Midwest and parts of Florida. <laughs> Five Guys is also it's a great standby. I love Five Guys for, I mean, you know you're going to get a fresh product every time you walk in that place. Smash Burger is also another great place. But in terms of the old school ones, I mean, In-N-Out, I like In-N-Out. In-N-Out on the West Coast, fantastic. It really is a great burger experience. The burger is not as good as a burger at Smash Burger or Five Guys or a Steak and Shake, but it's definitely a great hamburger experience, I like to call it. Okay. John Zager. I love Yeah. Five Guys is my go in, in the Atlanta airport. That's like my... My, uh, the place I go straight to, fantastic burger, man. So what's your, so what's your order, Wes? What do you get at Five Guys? Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> Everyone I has their burger. I that question correctly. I like their sauce. I like their Five Guys sauce that they that they put on the burger. Right. Um, I load it up. I get, I guess, <laughs> not the largest, but, yeah, I put ketchup on it, too. I'm sorry. Hate to, exactly, uh, hate I just put barbecue sauce good. on my burger at Five Guys. I do barbecue sauce uh, and uh, raw onions and pickles. Oh, that's that's what I and I do extra pickles all the time. So I need to look at the I, now I'm now that the expert has told me that ketchup is wrong for burgers. I'm I think I'm pretty much scarred for life now. Yes, no, 